since elementary school, I was fascinated by history because my parents grew up in, during the colonial time. And so uh, they were talking a lot about their experience. Those stories fed my interest into knowing history. Uh, and so that when I went to high school, I didn't even think twice. I said, I don't want business. I don't want physics. I don't want math. I like history. Hello and welcome. You're listening to Interdisciplinary. My name is Grace Garrett. I'm a senior at Bryn Mawr College about to graduate with a degree in International Studies and Russian. For this podcast series, I'll be going back over some of the key ideas of my major. Each episode, I'll sit down with an expert in a field related to International Studies. I'll ask them about the kinds of questions that interest them, as well as how they go about looking for answers. I hope you enjoy. It's an unusually beautiful day in February, 60 degrees and blue sky. I'm making my way across campus to meet with Professor Kalala Ngala Malume. He's been teaching here since 2000 in the History and Africana Studies departments. Hello. Hey, how are you? Doing well, how are you? Good. Instead of a desk, there's a circular table in the middle of the room, covered with a brightly patterned tablecloth. I take a seat across from Professor Ngala Malume, and we start to talk about his area of expertise, the history of health and disease in Western African countries. Thinking about medicine, I noticed that your research focus area is on health and yes. pathology. Uh, yes. Why did you choose to look at the history of that rather than yeah, the yes. medicine side? Again, because that has to do with uh, those stories I heard mm, you yeah. know, growing mm. up. Uh, how people went to build the railroads hmm. during the colonial time and how many people died. Walking on the street, going to school, and then running into people who come from the hospital, transporting a dead body to go outside, to go back to their villages. You are walking like this, and then you know, see people coming back. You see, you are stuck by these images. Um, and and so I, I I when I became a historian I started thinking about you know these medical institutions how their logic and so on and it became natural and if you look closely you will see that mo- many historians they they don't just choose topics at random often they are you know uh, informed by their own lives. Personal. Yeah, their experiences, what they saw. Yeah. And then naturally they they select these kind of issues uh, or things that struck them. You know, if you live during the period of civil rights movement, and so naturally you think about when you you select topics, these these topics are in your mind. You know, you want mm-hmm. to know more about this, more about that. Mm-hmm. Or if you come from a small town and then you saw things, and then yeah. Naturally, so biography informs also part yeah. of your research. I will give an example of uh, one great historian, Professor Van Sina, uh, a Belgian professor. He pulls two books out from the shelf to his left, Oral Traditions History and Paths in the Rainforests. Both are by Jan Van Sina. In the early 1950s, Van Sina began conducting field research among the Cuba of the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's Cuba with a K, by the way. After a long career teaching at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, he passed away just last year. The, the Cuba were, they are one of the most artistic people in, in Africa. They have a kingdom since the 17th century and so on, and, but their history was oral, so that historians didn't since missionaries didn't write down their history, so people thought, oh, these are people without history. We have people without writing system, then you don't have history. He traveled to Congo during the, in the 50s, mm-hmm. when Congo was still Belgium, and he observed that. He, he saw, that, you know, actually, there's more to it. He visited the, the kingdom, mm-hmm. so they have a rich history, but he's told orally. 
uh, and then their uh, sculptures tell history of the past and their uh, myths and uh, stories, oral traditions, they tell history. Then he engaged in using oral history, oral traditions as history, as documents. He analyzed them and he wrote the same way we analyze written sources. He did the same work of critical analysis and then he reconstructed their history from oral traditions. Is that a recent development um, in yeah, the field of history? Yeah, it is in the 60s. So he, which means he, he renovated historical methodology yeah. by saying that history can also be written without written material. He made oral history legitimate. Yeah. <laughs> source of history. Yeah, in addition to just, not just diplomacy, not just uh, political history, no. You can also talk about economic history, you can talk about social history. He was able to do that in part because he didn't just rely on the tools of traditional history. He studied also anthropology. Hmm. You see, so he found that okay, anthropology... <laughs> there you go, the interdisciplinary. <laughs> exactly, interdisciplinary. Anthropology, you know, with the field work, uh, go talk to people in the field, and then uh, collect their oral history, study their language, and so on, and then analyze it, you know, looking at yeah. the words and things that people use. And that uh, inspired me in, in my study of, uh, it makes sense of the story, some of the stories I was uh, hearing growing up about how ancestors, how a social order was created in the Kasai province. Following Van Sina's anthropological approach of reconstructing history, Professor Angala Malume started to analyze the stories he grew up with. One day, the chief, two of his daughters, went to collect wood in the bush, mm -hmm. and then they ran into a hunter. He gave them a basket full of wild birds, meat. And then they went home, they said, we, we ran into this man, he gave us these birds. He's a hunter. So I said, oh, okay. Tomorrow if you go, you see him, invite him to come home. And uh, of course, they went and then they saw him again. My father wants to see you. And then they came home. They welcomed him, said, no, you can stay with us. And then he stayed in the village. He married one of the daughters. And one day there was a dispute in the village and um, he intervened to give us a solution to the dispute and everybody agreed. They said, oh, he's smart. <laughs> Let's make him our chief. <laughs> 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 he became chief. And so, and then he became you know, the creator of a new social order in that place. It is only when I studied anthropology because I made I minored in anthropology mm -hmm. to understand these other stories the same way, you know, Vancina studied anthropology. Then I was able to learn about that myths can be de decoded to explain the history. And, and so I, I, sure. I went from myth to history. I analyzed it. I, I published an article on it. What's that article called? Uh, it is called... Uh, um, Myth, politics, and history, and then the myth of Mandekatawa. So I was able to use what the technique that the anthropology is called structural analysis mm -hmm. of the myth to divide it and then to to analyze its structure, transition from hunter to settled life. Yeah, you know, from nature to culture and so on. And so I came to see that actually it is. He followed the pattern of many princes. So he was a prince coming from the Luba Empire in the Katanga. Princes who, who didn't have a path to succession mm -hmm. would go elsewhere to reproduce the statecraft of the Luba Empire mm -hmm. in new regions. So that is his case. One question that international studies is interested in is what is a nation? How can it be defined? But looking for unifying factors or natural boundaries in geography or religion or language is a very tricky thing to do. 
So take language, for example. In the early 18th century, there was a German philosopher named Johann Gottlieb Fichte, and he wrote that the first original and truly natural boundaries of states are beyond doubt their internal boundaries. Those who speak the same language are joined to each other by a multitude of invisible bonds by nature herself, long before any human art begins. Later on, Hitler used this argument to justify invading neighboring countries、uh, where people spoke German. It reminds me of when I studied abroad in Russia in 2014. This was just after the annexation of Crimea. I spoke with a few people who were in support of it, or in support of a similar outcome in different regions of Ukraine. And an argument that they kept coming back to was linguistic similarity and the widespread use of Russian in Ukraine. One person my age went as far as to say that Ukrainian didn't exist and was in fact just a dialect of Russian. So language is certainly a great unifying factor, but I don't think it can answer the nation question. I'll just mention a few more voices that stood out to me from this really interesting debate. If you'd like a broader overview, I found Section Five of Language and Identity by John Joseph helpful. I've put information in the podcast notes. The Marxist take on nationalism was that it was a construct or so-called false consciousness invented to suppress the working class. Marx and Engels predicted that all nations would inevitably be folded into global communism, and they weren't the only ones to think that nationalism is an artificial idea. In the 1960s, there was a debate between two professors at the London School of Economics, Eli Kadouri and Ernest Gellner. Kadouri, who was a Middle East historian and taught politics, thought that nationalism is a European idea that almost accidentally came to being because of people like Kant and Fichte and what they wrote. He pointed out that it doesn't necessarily play out the same way in other parts of the world. His colleague Gellner, a social anthropologist who taught philosophy, wrote this in response. So nationalism is not at all accidental. Its roots are deep and important. It was indeed our destiny, and not some kind of contingent malady imposed on us by the scribblers of the late Enlightenment. He went on to say that it is the highly probable destiny of some men, and the unlikely condition of many others. Our task is to single out the differences which separate nationalism-prone and nationalism-resistant humanity. Gellner and Kadouri were apparently friends, by the way. A beautiful example of argument done right. Skipping back almost a century to 1882, I was struck reading about a famous address by the French linguist Ernest Renan. In French, it's called "What is a Nation?" He dramatically declared that nationhood is a shared mind and soul, a shared memory that is continuously validated by a community. I decided to ask Professor Ngala Malume about this. I have heard it described、uh, like what is national identity as a、uh, collective memory.、Mm-hmm. Absolutely, perfectly fits with an oral history.、Mm-hmm. The idea that your memories can be stored in a community rather than all in、mm-hmm. in one person.、Mm-hmm. What is your take on a nationhood or statehood?、Um, we have one is one scholar who looked at nation as an imagined co- community. His, his name is Anderson.、Uh, the imagined community. It is the product of history. You know,、um, a nation is a product of history, and it it is based on founding myths. You know, you can talk about George Washington. You know, cherry tree, all these things. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> and and so it is. Yeah, it is. A, we have a founding myth that is. At the beginning, it is in the past, and where people look at the story of the beginning, asking the question how we became who we are. You see,、mm-hmm. and so they then they built on it. That's why Anderson is talking about imagined community because it is based on founding myths. Some facts are real, but others are. You know,、uh, invented, embellishments, yeah, um, yeah <laughs> and so on, and so, so it is an idea. Yeah, yeah, it leaving out many other things, many things. You、mm-hmm. know, as an ideal to promote and to defend. Yeah, so so that's what actually it is a social construct,、uh, but the way it is promoted is for everybody to unite people around that idea. Yeah, and even if women. 
are left out of you know the process even if some minorities are left out you can look at ancient greece you know it was a slave society but democracy is becoming okay they invented this but was it a democratic society no it was for men only and not slaves you see these paradoxes a lot in history exactly it is for the french revolution it is for all the revolutions it is an idea but you know imperfect i i find that so interesting that Bryn Mawr, sort of the Bryn Mawr community uh, as an act of defining itself goes back over its history um, and and yeah and looks for those moments where people were left out um, yeah you see that with the renaming of College Hall yes, right here yes uh, and, and that's happening in universities in cities all exactly, over the country exactly so because we realized that um, yes it is about women's college because women were left out. But not all women. We are talking about all women. We talk about only some specific women. We see one race, one class. And and so the others were left out. And yeah. so when you look back, I say, oh, really? That's what it was? So, so the idea was great, but yet it had problems inside. And so we have uh, this the origin story that you were talking about for Bryn Mawr, and then suddenly something is, sort of comes along to to shake it up mm. and and yeah, contested that, voices. Yes. Mm. So we deconstruct it now. So okay, oh, so these are the yeah. problem. Yeah. So we deconstruct. The idea was good, but look at what it left out. Then okay, how what do we do about it? Yeah. So dealing with the past is the most difficult, you know. So how do you? How do you tell good sources from unreliable sources? I analyze their quality, yeah, their strength and their weaknesses. And, and their bias, maybe. Yeah, weaknesses. But by weaknesses, I talk about biases and okay. short, shortcomings. The sources cannot answer all my questions because of their quality, you know. And so that the job of a historian is to make sure to ask the questions and to the sources and then take into account when you read them to understand the conditions of their production. That is what helps uh, historians move toward objectivity. So that which means our interpretation will not be the, la the final interpretation of the, the evidence, but it will be the best interpretation with the tools we have of the evidence. Uh, we know that new tools can come and then you can know better. Uh, for example, one question I wanted to, to, to ask was, when I re read the uh, archives, French colonial doctors were complaining that Africans will come to the hospital only late. They were reluctant. They were resisting our medicine. They will come only for some those who have syphilis or something, only t it has reached tertiary level. Mother will come to the clinic for giving birth only if they had complication. They would prefer doing it at yeah. home and so on and so on. And so the conclusion was that they were irrational. They were resisting our medicine. So I, that's what I found in the archives. But I didn't want just to stop to accept that story. When I interviewed them, I found that Actually, they were doing that but for different reasons. Not that they were resisting medicine, but they had a broader definition of well-being. The well-being meant not just physical well-being. It meant also power. Huh. It meant also uh, wealth. You know, to increase your power, to increase mm -hmm. your wealth. All this part of, you know, part of the spectrum of well-being. Well mm -hmm. So that if you go to the doctor's office, you say, I want to become minister in the government. How can I increase my chance? They have nothing to offer you. Interesting. So you have to go to the healer <laughs> to say, listen, I want to, I am a merchant, I want to make more money. Oh my How goodness. do I attract <laughs> clients to my stall? In the, that's okay, you can do this when you have, you have in the 
in wow. marketing, do they, they say? Doctor life coaches. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I found a more complex story. It is not that they are irrational, as the archives say. It is rational because it is embedded in their history, in their stories they tell and so on. Very interesting. I had two last questions I wanted to ask, and these ones are just kind of for fun. First one is, if you pick up a newspaper and there's some major world event, something has just happened, like, you know, this morning, South African president uh, resigned. Mm. What questions pop to your mind if you're thinking of, like, a historian? Mm. What are the first things you want to know? The quality of the democracy. Mm. <laughs> See, which means the strength of their institutions. It tells me something about South Africa as having strong democratic institutions. When a, a party can remove the president of that party, who is president of the republic, from office, you see. Where you have weak institutions, like in the Congo, the president is corrupting everybody, controlling, the parliament doesn't have to do any work, and everybody is, uh, you know, in the pocket of the president, you see. Which means it tells me that, yeah, there in the Congo you have a weak, we have weak institutions. So current events for you, for a historian, are almost like a symptoms or like a, a diagnosis of it tells the something. state of the state or the, <laughs> the state of the state, the health of the state. Yeah, it current event uh, can uh, can highlight the strength of institutions mm -hmm. or the weakness of institutions, or you know, people come with excuses, excuses for the president to stay on twenty years, thirty years. It shows that yeah, here we have a weak state, we have uh, uh, yeah a failed state here. Here we have big man, yeah, weak institution. There we have strong institution, and everybody has to comply. You know, that's what it tells me. Okay, so the last question, uh, just for fun, we've kind of got to hear about how a historian thinks. Now I want to know how does a historian imagine? Um, so my question is, if some, you know, team of inventors, scientists come to you and say, we have invented a time machine mm -hmm. and we've decided we want someone who, who knows what they're doing, a historian, to go back in time to some historical event, um, would you take this offer? Would you go, would you choose to go and just observe or would you try to... Uh, to change history? <laughs> uh, first, I would doubt about the capacity. <laughs> <laughs> the I would doubt fun. about, yeah, I would doubt about the capacity of that machine. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the story that I'm interested in is about cosmogony, uh, the Big Bang, or, you know, <laughs> you see. Uh, I mean, the Big Bang, that, there it is, you know, that's the creation of time and space. Because we have those stories. For example, you go, uh, there's one group in West Africa. In their cosmogony, they tell you the creation story. How the world became the world. Or, or in Egyptian, ancient Egyptians' story of creation. It sounds like the Big Bang. Yeah, they say at the beginning, a tomb was there. Inert. He said he couldn't move. And then suddenly, an idea came to his mind and then he imagined mm -hmm. something and then he came out of that. He, he was kind of in a primordial water, you know, there, yeah. and then he comes out of it. An idea coming to him, you know, here I am, I can't move, I can't. Then an idea and then he came out of that. He's now into action mode, <laughs> you see. So action being triggered by will, good by strong will and intelligence. And then he says, okay, now I want to, to start working. So he, he, he's the same, but now he's in action. He's no longer atom, he's now re. That story they tell, you see scientists tell you the same story, physicists and others. Quantum theory tells you that Everything is matter, and matter is energy. So you see, it doesn't contradict that story. I found that fascinating. 
So if someone gives you a time machine and you go back to the very beginning to, of time. Yes, to the, to the Big Bang. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. That's fascinating. Uh, yes. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And that is it for today. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to read more about the topics discussed, I've put some links in the podcast notes. The music you're hearing is by David Seste and available on the Free Music Archive. Finally, I'd like to thank my advisor, Michael Allen, for helping me with this project, and of course, Professor Ngala Malume for taking the time to share his experiences with me. I'll be back next week with another guest, so check back if you're interested. Until then, cheers. <laughs>